You can simply assume that there are no contradictions. You can come to the task with it saying, look, the Bible's the word of God. God gave us this word. It cannot have mistakes in it. So there cannot be contradictions. If you come at it with that assumption, you will not find mistakes because there can't be mistakes. So if there can't be mistakes, there aren't mistakes. Okay, so it's very simple. In theory, just about anything can be reconciled if you work hard enough at it. I walked to Chicago yesterday. Well, I was on the plane and I walked up and down the aisle. So technically speaking, I did walk to Chicago. Okay, uh, but that isn't how we talk, right? That isn't, we don't talk that way. So in theory, you can reconcile, and you can reconcile anything in the Bible you want. There is nothing you cannot reconcile. If you can't already tell from living in the world, people have an amazing propensity to see what they want to see. Just one example of this is the non-trivial number of people there are who have different holy books all bending over backward to avoid admitting that they contain mistakes, contradictions, or anything like that. But is it really true that every holy book ever is pristinely perfect, or is something else going on here? I think the answer to that is pretty obvious. People are blind to what's right in front of them. I mean, some come right out and basically say it. As Al Mohler explains, quote, I do not allow any line of evidence from outside the Bible to nullify to the slightest degree the truthfulness of any text in all that the text asserts and claims, unquote. Or closer to home. If the Holy Spirit really is telling me, if God himself is telling me something, then Somebody over here in a field, say archaeology or textual criticism, trying to tell me that that's wrong. Well, that person is certainly not as knowledgeable or trustworthy as God. What Christians of many persuasions do when confronted with Bible contradictions specifically is become expert harmonizers. After all, there is no possible way the Bible could be in error. Somewhere within the Bible, I would find a passage that said 2 plus 2 equals 5. I wouldn't question what I'm reading in the Bible. I would believe it, accept it as true, and then do my best to work it out and to understand it. But before talking about the specifics of Bible difficulties, we need to lay some groundwork. Something people on both sides typically fail to do. If we don't want to presuppose that the Bible is God's word before analyzing it, something there is zero reason to do, we need to ask a series of questions. First, what is the Bible? Well, it's not a book in the traditional sense. It's a collection of texts written by various authors in different genres over the course of thousands of years. What does this mean about the expectations we should bring to it? Well, we should expect there to be conflicting details, theological assumptions, mistakes, etc. These kinds of things are what we should expect from a bunch of texts written by flawed human beings over a huge chunk of time. Given the very nature of the texts in question, it would be surprising if we didn't find those things. So, unless demonstrated otherwise, the default approach should be to treat the Bible like we would any other relevantly similar collection of texts. We should let the texts speak for themselves without trying to impose a foreign interpretive framework onto them, because to do so is not only lazy, but does violence to the unique meaning that can be found when taking the various authors on their own terms. In fancy talk, the prior probability that the Bible is going to look all too human is going to be high. This is crucial to understand, because what this means is that when we get to examples of what very plausibly appear to be errors or discrepancies of one kind or another, it's going to be more probable that they actually are genuine difficulties than that they're not. And it won't matter that there's a possible, say, harmonization, because you can literally harmonize anything you want to if you try hard enough. Stephen Law demonstrates this quite nicely. Dogs are planning an invasion. It is imminent. The Venusian invasion is going to be with us shortly, and then you won't be laughing. The dogs that are here are sending back their secret reports to Venus, to the invasion force. Now, you probably think that that's a bit nutty, uh, but what 
I can do is, for every objection you raise, I can probably cook up an explanation. Let's have a look. Um, you might say, Stephen, dogs can't even speak. I say, yeah, they can. They just choose to hide their language from us. You've got to remember we're dealing with advanced alien beings. Of course they're going to have that ability. Um, you might say, but Stephen, Venus is a dead planet. It's horribly hot and swathed in clouds of sulfuric acid. No dog could survive on the surface of that planet. I say, they don't live on the surface. They live in deep underground bunkers from which they are planning their invasion. Why do you think they want to come here? They don't want to live there anymore. Uh, it's too unpleasant. So I can accommodate that piece of evidence too. Dogs have no transmitters to send their secret reports, you might say. I say they do. You might not find the, the transmitter in the dog's basket. It's in its brain. It's, it's secreted away in there. Uh, you might say, well, we've dissected the dog's brain and we can't find any transmitter. I say it's made out of material which is indistinguishable from brain stuff, and that's why you can't detect it. You might say, we've scanned the dog's brain, there's nothing coming out. I, mean, I say they are transmitting on a frequency or in, within a medium that is currently beyond our ability to detect. Okay? Remember, these beings are beyond our you know, far beyond us technologically, of course they're going to have this kind of technology. So the mere fact that you can't detect the signals is no evidence that there ain't no signals there, is it? Um, so you can see how that conversation could continue, you know, irritatingly forever, pretty much. The reason this example is funny is that extensive harmonization is funny when we can see that it's being employed to defend an improbable theory. And a theory like, the biblical texts contain no discrepancies, conflicting details and theology, errors, etc., is definitely an initially improbable theory. Plus, it certainly looks like it contains those things. I have a nice little library of Christian apologetic texts, and one of them is called The Big Book of Bible Difficulties, which tries to answer every alleged error or contradiction. And let me just drop it on the desk here. It is over 600 pages long. The existence and size of this book are hilarious given that the two authors believe the Bible is the perfect word of God himself. If it looks like a duck, and quacks like a duck, and as we've discussed so far, you already know you should expect ducks in the area, then it's probably a duck. Okay, that was just a mean skeptic, you might say. But Christian scholar Kenton Sparks makes a similar point. Quote, a third indication of fideism appears when an unusual or unexpected amount of effort is necessary to defend our beliefs. For instance, one wonders why a prominent evangelical scholar required an encyclopedia to resolve the apparent errors in a Bible that he claimed was free of human error. Is it not possible, in light of so many difficulties, that the author's beliefs about the Bible were in some respect mistaken? Unquote. And it's not just that there appear to be a lot of Bible contradictions, but the fallout and boots on the ground reality of the church is exactly what we would expect on the hypothesis that the difficulties are in fact real rather than just imagined. Sociologist Christian Smith writes, quote, On important matters, the Bible apparently is not clear, consistent, and univocal enough to enable the best-intentioned, most highly skilled, believing readers to come to agreement as to what it teaches. This is an empirical, historical, undeniable, and ever-present reality. It is, in fact, the single reality that has most shaped the organizational and cultural life of the Christian Church, which now, particularly in the United States, exists in a state of massive fragmentation." Unquote. It's also important to note that the majority of scholars, both Christian and non-Christian, don't see the Bible as the book conservative believers think it is. In other words, according to the scholarly consensus, the Bible is obviously not inerrant in the way that many people want it to be. Why does this matter? It's just common sense that if your views conflict with the majority of experts in a particular field, you better have really good reasons for holding them. In this case, there's only a tiny minority that defend very conservative positions, and it's almost certainly for theological reasons. So let me illustrate why this is a problem. Let me start with an illustration I've used before. Say your friend saw a squirrel eating a peanut. The demographics of squirrels where you live are 70% gray and 30% red. Then let's say 90% of each demographic likes peanuts. And for the sake of the example, let's say they have equal accessibility to peanuts. 
The probability that the squirrel your friend saw was gray is higher than that it's red because it takes up more probability space on this nifty chart here. And in this case, it's because the prior probability of it being a gray squirrel is higher because there are more of them. Make sense? Good. Now you know bays. Sorry to interrupt this video, you guys, but look at my wife feeding this baby squirrel by hand. Isn't that cool? Wow. Okay, back to the topic at hand. If you aren't going to be cripplingly biased, you should be able to see that the prior probability of a collection of texts like the Bible being pristinely perfect is going to be low by its very nature. It's a library of books written by flawed human beings over time. It would be a miracle if it was. I think it's going to be extremely low, but I don't have to set it that low to make my point, so I'll be nice. Let's now consider some of the previous data points. The appearance of a lot of difficulties, the fragmentation of the church in a manner highly consistent with trying to treat a library of books as if they speak with one voice when they in fact do not, and a scholarly consensus that the Bible is in fact not inerrant. All of this data is surprising on the hypothesis that the Bible is inerrant, and exactly what we would expect if it were not. I think the probability space would look something like this, though as I've said before, I'd set the prior way lower. Since we know that it's more probable than not that the Bible will contain mistakes, that should influence how we think about specific cases. So let's turn to a specific test case. The death of Judas Iscariot. Mm -hmm. okay. In Matthew's Gospel, Judas hangs himself. Mm -hmm. And what happens is he goes, uh, he feels remorse about what he's done. He's betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. He, he tries to return the 30 pieces. The high priest won't take it. So he throws them down in the temple and goes off and hangs himself. And um, the priests then say, oh, we've got these 30 pieces of silver. We can't put them back in the treasury because it's blood money. It's mm -hmm. used to betray blood. And so, so they go off and they buy a field, and it's called the field of blood because mm -hmm. it's purchased the blood money after Judas has hanged himself. Luke also wrote the book of Acts, as we were saying, mm -hmm. and in chapter 1, there's a second account of Judas' death. In this account, what happens is uh, there's nothing about Judas hanging himself, nothing about the priest buying the field. In this account, Judas goes and buys the field before he dies, and he doesn't hang himself. He somehow falls head first, and his, his intestines broke, break open and bleed all over the ground. Mm -hmm. And so the people in Jerusalem start calling this the field of blood because Judas okay. bled all over it. So, so Those two so, accounts so, cannot be reconciled. Okay, okay. It's important to note that he's not the only one who sees a problem here. As evangelical scholar Craig Evans explains, quote, Both Matthew and Luke know of Judas' suicide, though the versions of the story they provide differ at many points. There have been attempts to harmonize the Matthaean and Lucan accounts, suggesting that Judas hanged himself but fell, or after dying, some days later fell, and burst open on impact. Perhaps, but it is more likely that the early church had heard two separate accounts." Unquote. Okay, so there's conflicting accounts of how Judas died. But, as Ehrman insinuated, there's a lot more going on than that, and my friend the amateur exegete lays out the issues very succinctly. Quote, what are the key differences between these two versions of events? 1. In the Matthaean account, Judas dies by hanging himself. In the Lucan, he dies by falling headlong in the field he had purchased, splitting open in the middle and having his gut spill out. 2. In the Matthaean account, Judas returns the money he had been given to betray Jesus, and it is the chief priests who purchase a field. In the Lucan, Judas is the one who purchases the field. 3. In the Matthaean account, the etiology for field of blood is that it was purchased with blood money, i.e. the money given to Judas to betray Jesus. In the Lucan, the etiology for field of blood is that Judas met a bloody end in the field." Unquote. For those who are looking for a more in-depth response to the many attempted harmonizations of these passages, then see the link to the full post in the description. The point of bringing this up as a test case is this. If you twist yourself into a pretzel trying to deny extremely plausible examples of Bible contradictions, you're just telling on yourself. There is no reason to do that, 
over and over and over unless you have dogmatic pre-commitments about what the Bible must be that are suspicious, as they say. Maybe you ground those pre-commitments in a religious experience. God speaks to you through the Bible. Tap this video on screen now to see why you should be skeptical of that.